welcome to Radical Feminist Perspectives. Today we are going to hear about the book Woman and Nature by Susan Griff Griffin and it's being discussed by Lierre Keith and Marion Rotigliano. So um, over to you Marion and Lierre. Hi, um, it's Marion Rotigliano. Um, are you there Lierre? Yeah, I'm here. Yeah, okay. Um, First slide. First slide. Okay, I'm waiting for it to move. You know, it always does this where it just refuses to go. Come on. Oh, modern technology wow. making our lives easier. You know, easier. it worked so fine when we were practicing. And now, of course, it just doesn't budge. There we go. Okay. There we go. So um, the context for this book uh, 1956 is the Clean Air Act in the UK, 1963 is the Clean Air Act in the USA, 1964 sees the publication of Silent Spring by Rachel Carson, which of course is this incredibly foundational moment to the environmental movement. And then 1964, we have the Wilderness Act here in the United States, 1972 is the Clean Water Act, 1973 is the Endangered Species Act. These are all the kind of linchpins of the of what the environmental environmental movement has legally has been able to use to try to protect what's left of the wild and try to protect the planet. Um, and so in 1974, she begins writing this book called Woman in Nature. And, and then it's published in 1978, 1979, depending on which, which version you have. Um, but these were really, really important sort of legal milestones that helped build what we know of as the environmental movement, because it gave people a, a way to actually fight back in the courts. Um, and just if you don't understand how important some of these things were, especially if you're young, I grew up in a city where the main river caught on fire. Um, and there's a lot of people in the United States who have stories like that, like the number of rivers that were so I mean, they were just being used as public sores and industry was just dumping stuff into the waterways to the point where they literally just caught on fire. Um, and the Clean Air Act in 1963, there's, I remember a very poignant moment in Al Gore's film, An Inconvenient Truth, where it's either, I don't remember whether it's Antarctica or the Arctic, but it's either the North Pole or the South Pole. And you see the scientists taking out the core the ice core to talk about, you know, how we know that carbon levels are increasing because you can take these ice cores that are thousands of years old. So he's, and you can see how much carbon is in it. So there's a, um, I have to start my video. Um, and you see that it's very, very cloudy. It's like gray and icky. And then all of a sudden it's clear again. And he, it's a throwaway comment, but the guy says, this is the clean air act. So the air got completely cleaned up at that point because of the they made them put scrubbers in the machinery. Anyway, all of this stuff happens. So there's a, a very, um, you know, very happening kind of movement that is people really committed to trying to protect the planet. And then there's this moment where feminism and environmentalism come together and, and women start to understand that there's this huge connection between the destruction of the planet and what men are doing to women. And I should um, just really interject in between here, um, in between 1964 and 72, in 1970, um, the Environmental Protection Agency was was formed, was created. Um, and it started out really a bunch of supposed tree huggers. Um, it, it, and it really had a mission. It is not, there's no secretary of the environment because it was felt to be so important that it was directly in the office of the president. And the president at the time was Richard Nixon. Um, right. who who felt very strongly about this. So um, right in between that Wilderness Act and Clean Water Act was the creation of an, enti an entirely new um, it, um, U.S. Uh, cabinet level office in the office of the president. Yeah, and he talked it later. The reason that he did that was because he was so terrified of the power that people had because the movement was so organized and they really had demands and they really meant it. And he would look out the White House window and see these people marching day after day after day. And he knew that they could potentially unseat him as president. And so it was because of the power that people knew they had and the pressure they were willing to apply to their government that we got these things done. So, all right, so that's kind of where this all comes from. Um, and then we have Susan Griffin. So she's written, she was born in 1943. She's written 
a huge number of books, many of which have been, um, have gotten like just enormous level of accolade. She won a MacArthur grant. She got fellowships from both the National Endowment for the Arts and the Guggenheim Foundation. She won an Emmy Award for her play Voices and she was a finalist for a Pulitzer Prize and they don't just give those to anybody. So I would say as radical feminists, uh, she's our most um, decorated uh, veteran. So if you haven't read her work, you, you really should dip into it because there's a lot here. Um, that first article at the top there, Rape the All-American Crime, that was absolutely groundbreaking. This was probably the first time that a, a major publication took on this idea that rape was a political crime, that it wasn't just something that happened, it wasn't just nature, didn't just fall out of the sky on women from nowhere. Uh, this was the first feminist analysis that really hit the mainstream left. Ramparts was a huge leftist uh, journal. It was very, um, very intellectual. It had a huge impact on the quote, new left in the 60s. Um, they, for instance, had a really groundbreaking photo essay that was called The Children of Vietnam that showed the napalm injuries to children that had never been done before. And it hugely turned the popular support for the war against the war, including people like Martin Luther King. He was not particularly against the war until he saw that article. And then he very publicly came out against the war because it was so hideous. Anyway, Ramparts did stuff like that. And then they did publish this article by Susan Griffin. Um, and then in 1978, she writes Woman in Nature. Um, this is the central thesis of the book. The fact that man does not consider himself a part of nature, but indeed considers himself superior to matter seem to me to gain significance when placed against man's attitude that woman is both inferior to him and closer to nature. So she shows how women have been identified with the earth, starting with Plato's division of the world into spirit and matter. She shows how Western philosophy and science have been a project of power over women and nature both. And she draws any vast range of sources from the Bible to medical texts, to literature, to scientific journals, like just the depth of what she grapples with in this book is amazing. Um, and I first read this book when I was 17 and I can't say that I understood everything that was going on. Rereading it now, I am just amazed at the breadth of her knowledge, like where she got all this stuff from um, is, is really, it's really quite extraordinary. So, and I read an interview with her and she talks about what really kicked this off was she was doing dishes one night and she says, quote, I heard a broadcast on the radio about plutonium and it was very disturbing to me. I felt such a lack of control over my own world because it was so beyond my knowledge. What can you do about it? And how can you protect your children? I had a small, small child then, my daughter. I also realized that about the same time that if I was going to do a critique of the Western tradition and particularly Western science, I couldn't do it from a scientific point of view. My strength was really in my own experience as a woman. And remember that that is really central to the kind of feminist method of consciousness raising. So what she knew was what she, well, her life as she had lived it as, as a woman, as the life that she had, but that had already been politicized for her. So she realized that she did have something to stand on and it gave her enough confidence that she could write this incredible book. So she goes on, the first 43 pages take you through my own interpretation of the history of science, revealing how science developed with the social construct that women are inferior and that nature is inferior and that they are inferior in the same way. So this book is not a political manifesto and it's not a polemical text. It's something really different. It's more mythic. It's almost a journey to confront what has gone so horribly wrong over the last 6,000 years. So the structure of the book, she says, I began the book by tracing a history of patriarchy's judgments about the nature of matter or the nature of nature and placed these judgments side by side chronologically with men's opinions about the nature of women throughout history. From this philosophical beginning, the book becomes more actual, treating of the effect of patriarchal logic on material beings. And so the first book, Matter, continues the analogy drawn between woman and nature into explorations of earth, trees, cows, show horses, and women's bodies as we all exist in patriarchy. 
Um, and then the second book is entitled Separation. And it's beginning with the separation of the womb from a woman's body. And it lists and protests against all those separations, which are part of civilized males thinking and living. So mind from emotion, body from soul, and reveals that separation, which patriarchy requires us to make from ourselves. The third book called Passage finally separates our consciousness from the consciousness of patriarchy. And thus the fourth book is called Her Vision. Now she sees through her own eyes. So this is just the, the table of contents and you can see like how deep she gets in this book. So how man regards and makes use of woman and nature, matter, land, her changing face, timber, what was there for them, wind in which he harnesses the elements, cows, the way we yield, mules, the domesticated speak, the show horse and the domesticated learn to please. That chapter is like made me cry. It was so incredible. Her body and he makes her body over to his liking. And then book two, so this is all about male power. His power, he tames what is wild, the hunt whereby he captures her wildness, the zoological garden in which he, she paces in her cage, the garden wherein he civilizes wilderness, his vigilance, his knowledge, his control, his certainty, his cataclysm, his secrets, and finally terror in which he warns her with his vision of the universe. The style of this book, we're just kind of warning you because it's not like other things you might read. Um, and so this is a quote from her. Since patriarchal thought does, however, represent itself as emotionless, objective, detached, and bodiless, the dicta of Western civilization and science on the subjects of women and nature in this book are written in a parody of a voice with such presumptions. The voice rarely uses a personal pronoun, never speaks as I or we, and almost always implies that it has found absolute truth, or at least has the authority to do so. In writing this book, this paternal voice became quite real to me, and I was afraid of it. It sprang out at me in the form of recognized opinion and told me that the reactions I experienced in my female body to its declarations were ridiculous, unfounded, hysterical, biased. You will recognize that voice from its use of phrases as it is decided or this discovery was made. So she uses representative voices of patriarchy and in between the voice of the patriarchal narrator, she weaves in a parallel narrative. So for instance, in the story of land, we also hear the story of Sacagawea. In the second section on timber, she contrasts timber manuals with a managerial handbook on picking quote girls for the office and how the structure of the office, you have to get the most out of them, just like the forest is felled and trees are farmed for their most uniform, profitable timber. When she contrasts with the process of a hurricane with a woman trying to run away from a mental hospital, and it's incredibly moving. In the chapter Cow, she, there's expert advice on dairy cows and it's interspersed with grueling passages on women's experiences of pregnancy and childbirth. Um, so from there, Marion, I'm going to turn it over to you and we'll start with um, Plato's, Plato's cave. Um, yeah, th this, um, it is decided that matter is transitory and, oh, actually the, uh, um, the quote is a little covered up by our pictures. Um, I don't know how to minimize us. There we go. Um, it is decided that matter is transitory and illusory, like the shadows on a wall cast by firelight that we dwell in a cave, in the cave of our flesh, which is also matter, also illusory. It is decided that what is real is outside the cave in a light brighter than we can imagine. Um, the, that the idea of matter existed before matter and is more perfect, ideal. All right. Uh, hang on a sec, I'm uh, working with the... Uh, not having my picture cover up her wonderful words. Matter is transitory and illusory, it is said. This world is an allegory for the next. The moon is an image of the church, which reflects divine light. The wind is an image of the spirit. So you start the book, and this is some of the first things you read, and you're like, what? Um, so this is part of um, what Lierre has already gone over and how the book is structured, and you wonder, what is she talking about? Where is, where is this coming from? And it goes on. There's a, a little, a couple of lines in between these, and that there, and there are um, paragraphs after that. And within the first page or two, um, she has basically covered Western philosophy and religion, um, and ha and and it is clearly all patriarchal. Um, she is 
um, she talked, it is talking about the language of Western philosophy and religion, the development of science, all directed at establishing and maintaining male power over women and the natural world and nature. So, so you see um, that she is going to um, going to talk about how man, um, in his conquering of, and she tells a story about finding, you know, finding the Americas, um, exploring across the country, Lewis and Clark being guided to Sacagawea, getting to the Pacific Ocean, and then deciding to um, to rape the rape the land like they did um, the indigenous women um, by cutting down all those magnificent trees out there. Um, and all the everything that follows, um, you know, some of it is where does it come from? Some of it is in the back of the book. Um, but within that first page, she she goes over um, Plato, um, Descartes, Cartesian dualism, Thomas Aquinas, Catholicism, Aristotle's argument from reason, more Thomas Aquinas, Greek philosophy, early Christian theology, more St. Augustine and Roger Bacon. And you may not have read all of that, and you may not know where that comes from. So if you know, if you can recognize it, um, it's great. If it's in the back of the book, it's great. If it if it isn't, just go with it. Um, it comes from a huge number of sources, an absolutely enormous number of sources that um, that she takes through um, West, Western history. Um, next slide. Um, this is Marion. This is a quote from Marion Sims, who invented the speculum. Um, and the only people who are going to know about um, what that means is actual women. Um, Marion Sims said that when he when he used first used the speculum, he says, "I saw everything as no man as no man has ever seen before. I felt like an felt like an explorer in medicine who first views a new and important territory." Um, if you if you um, if there was any doubt, um, she's talking about men viewing women the way they do um, nature, the way they do um, the land or anything else to be e explored and exploited. Um, next slide. Indeed, it is written that the human race tends to outrun subsistence and is kept in bounds only by famine, pestilence, or war. And this struggle is called a natural government, and this warfare is said to lead to perfection. And it is suggested that war serves for the real health of humanity and the building of strong races. And it is declared that the history of human society is the history of class struggle, that the collisions between the classes will end in the victory of the proletariat. And the development of large corporations, it is pointed out, is also merely the survival of the fittest, merely working out the law of nature and a law of God. Um, this is this is very um, 18th, 19th century, um, going into the 20th century uh, about um, you know um, the uh, the the inevitability of conquering, the inevitability of conquering the land, um, the inevitability of, of conquering women. Um, the these again, you can look in the back of the book to see where the sources are, um, but there are you know there are um, uh, there is a um, a view um, that that war um, and this came with um, this came as a like sort of a an extrapolation of of Darwin and Lamarck survival of the fit survival of the fittest um, Darwin was survival of the fit you know you have reproductive success when you when when what you reproduce is is um, works well in the world and Lamarck said the five, survival of the fittest that it was a, a fight and a struggle um, and that was applied to um, man's conquest of the nation of um of nature um and of the natural world and then um it 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 was extrapolated with no real connection um except for men's <laughs> um men's uh, uh socialization um it was extrapolated to apply to women next slide on the arable land the cultivators will be increasingly mechanized the management and operation of the machines being the responsibility of one group of workers. Field sizes will have to be reshaped, enlarged, make cultivation, cultivation easier, weeds being controlled by herbicides, crop varieties, bread to meet the, meet the needs of mechanized farming, bread. Um, what, is that, what does that mean when you apply it to, to women? Um, 
the crops will be protected protected against pests and diseases. Um, and so, I mean, it's a it's a farming manual. Um, the very use um, man ma man makes of women destroys her most pernicious power. Weighed down by, by maternity, she loses her erotic attraction. Um, so, as if while you're breeding the land um, to meet your needs, you're also breeding women to meet your needs. Um, putting virgin soil under cultivation initiates a breakdown of what may be called the body of the soil. Again, um, it, it it is it is a um, an extrapolation, a comparison of what man does to the land um, that he also does to women, um, and and there, as much as um, men view breeding the land, um, they also view breeding women and grooming women. Next slide. He breaks the wilderness. And when you hear wilderness and nature, just substitute in like women. He clears the land of trees, brush, weed. Um, he grooms women of weeds, the weeds in her, her nature, her life. Um, the land is brought under control. Women are brought under his control. He has turned the waste into a garden, into her soil, he places his plow. He labors, he plants, he sows. By the sweat of her brow, he makes her yield, deciphering the secrets of, of the soil. The story of the carbon cycle, he masters the properties of chlorophyll. Carbon cycle just means, um, you know, that that plants, uh, you know, they, they take in oxygen, they produce carbon dioxide, the carbon dioxide, and the plants also decompose um, and release more carbon into the soil, the soil, you know, the the soil and the plants um, and the, the products of the soil are eaten by, you know, by animals, by us, um, well, we're animals, um, and then, you know, eventually go back into, um, um, and then eventually we decompose and, and release more um, more carbon into the soil, into nature, it all becomes fossil fuels, and, um, and we, you know, breathe in oxygen, breathe out carbon. That's the carbon cycle. Besides the story of the nitrogen cycle, I, I won't uh, I won't go through all these through all these cycles. Um, but nitrogen is um, taken out of the air. These things are exploited. He says the soil is a lifeless place of storage. What is tilled by farmers? That the land no longer need lie fallow. That what went on in her quietude is no longer a secret. That the ways of the land can be managed. That the farmer can ask whatever he wishes of the land. Substitute in woman when whenever it's talking about nature um and and the land next slide please the cow may begin to show bad habits and this is in the section talking about um animal husbandry um she may suck her own teats or those of other cows in other words she may try to make herself comfortable imagine that cow trying to make herself comfortable but secure a metal anti-sucking device and fasten it in the cow's nostrils like a scold's bridle, or put a halter on her and all the and on the halter strap, a nose strap, covered by another strap. This is like a really, I mean, it's a really uncomfortable, awful thing to do to a cow. She may kick, secure a set of hobbles and fasten the fasten these on her legs. So essentially you're grooming a cow, um, the way you would groom a young girl trying to rebel, trying to make herself happy, the way you would you would try to groom a woman that you would try a, a man would try to groom a woman or did through the, you know, through the ages and probably still does, um, trying to uh, um, have some sort of an independent life. And somebody in this chat is saying, yeah. women used to use hobble skirts. Um, and yeah. Uh, yeah, next slide, which I think uh, I'll turn it back over to you, Lier. Yeah, so this um, chapter is uh, about numbers and about counting and how uh, the patriarchal mind, the patriarchal male uses numbers as a form of control. So this goes on for like three pages where it's just this list of things that he is measuring and how that means he is in control of everything. I'm not gonna read this whole thing, but it's incredibly poetic and also very profound and moving the way that these, these three pages kind of unfold. This is near the end of that first chapter or the first sort of section of the book. So. Um, you've been through a lot at this point, if you've gotten to this far in the book, and a lot of it is, you know, it's very difficult material, like reading about the cows and the horses and the, the way that the world has been destroyed, essentially, by this patriarchal imperative. 
Um, but at the very end, he tells us how big he is. He measures his height. He demonstrates his strength. He measures what he can lift, what he can conquer. He calculates his feelings. He numbers his armies. He measures our virtue. So it's, you know, three pages like this where he keeps counting. And every time he counts, it's another way that he is ruling the universe and showing us how powerful he is. But this section ends with this incredibly beautiful paragraph where you finally, finally see that it's about to turn because now there's resistance finally, because this counter narrative that's there throughout this sort of second voice that's always there where she speaks in we, and it's like this sort of collective of women that are somehow in the background, they start to come to the fore right here in this paragraph. And so in the women's voice counting, we count each second, no moment do we forget. We live through every hour. We are counting the number he has killed, the number he has bound into servitude, the number he has maimed, stolen from, left to starve. We measure his virtue. We count the value of our lives. We are counting the least act of the smallest one, her slightest gesture, and we count the ultimate reality of her breath, barely visible, now in the just cold air, one, two, three, we say, as it shows itself in small clouds, four, five, six, and disappears from moment seven, eight, nine to moment. So all of a sudden, it's like the women see and they see each other and they see the smallest one, the one of least value, and they realize that she has value and we are going to count her. And this is when you realize that this book it's going to turn now. It's going to start to turn to, you know, the resistance to this patriarchal narrative. Okay, Marion, this one's yours. Marion, are you there? I mute myself, yeah. Um, I okay. thought the counting <laughs> section was really interesting because when you start the book, um, they're, they're, you know, she, she's looking at, at Plato, and she's looking at philosophers, um, and, and part of, um, I mean, the very first thing, the foundation of Western philosophy, as it were, um, was this platonic um, concept of ideals that, that, that um, what we see in the world, we only recognize because it exists as an idea, as an ideal, um, and there was a sort of a, a God concept, but it was really pretty amorphous, um, and the ideal was the reality and matter you know, it starts out with matter, that was just um, a copy, a pale copy, as it were. Um, and that that is kind of, you know, as radical feminists, we um, we have a, um, a material analysis. We start with very, very concrete material facts that um, a, a sperm carrying an X chromosome fertilizes an ovum, which always has an X chromosome, and, and a person is born who is female. That is a material reality. And things that happen to us are based on that material reality. So, uh, you know, getting to the point that, you know, of finally recognizing things, oddly enough, um, came under um, mathematics in a way, which is people hate it because it's very, very abstract. Um, but it, but it, um, you can count things with it. You can make the abstract concrete. They talk about a Laplace transformation. And again, you know, this is not going to be a calculus class, but um, but that particular equation um, specifically is used in analyzing and designing control systems um, to make um, some very abstract concepts in electricity and some other areas um, usable as material reality. Um, so the fact that she, that she did that, I mean, you know, first time I read that and saw that, and now that I reread it, I realized how, how profound that was um, because recognizing that material reality, which is what radical feminism does, is how the awakening, um, how women's awakening occurs. Um, so this is talking, um, you know, she goes on to talk more specifically about um, damage being done, fuel assemblies are being are shipped by truck, uncrated on arrival, stored underwater, for an average of five months to let shorter lived radioactive wastes decay. And yes, this is really done. Um, fuel elements were then taken out, chopped into pieces, and the spent fuel was dissolved in nitric acid. The hulls of the fuel elements and all of their hardware were rinsed off and sent to the burial ground. Hot waste for nuclear power. Um, 
but what happens to all that? I mean, I didn't go into all the, you know, I went into the carbon cycle very basically. And, and I apologize if you, you know, felt like you were back in class, didn't go into the nitrogen cycle, but I can if anybody's interested. Um, but the the whole idea of all those cycles, including um, what's going to happen with all this nuclear waste is is that question, what's going to happen to it? You, we, you know, you dump um, nuclear waste um, into the ocean. Um, the uh, the shorter lived radioactive wastes are decay. Okay, that's fine. But what happens to it? Where does it go? Um, and the analogy with um, with uh, um, um, with women, you know, with with exploiting women the way you exploit nature is yes. When you when you um, exploit women, when you abuse women, when you submerge women um, underwater, so that so that some of their um, radioactive um, uh, rebellion um, dies off, what happens to it? Next slide. Jessica doesn't get it. Um, well, put a question in the chat. Um, next slide. Sorry, it's not advancing and I don't know why. Come on. All right. Come on, um, we can do well, this. We can talk more about um, <laughs> about the life cycle of, of something. There. Okay, okay, here we go. The spiraling descent. Oh, oh, wait, one second before you go on. That section about the nuclear waste that comes at the end of that second chapter where it, it's entitled Terror. And it's all about, you know, the ultimate control that men are now. It's just this, the utter necrophilia of the, the patriarchal imperative. And that's why she's talking about that. And remember that when she wrote this book, it was inspired by hearing about the horrors of nuclear waste and nuclear war on the radio and she's like, they're just going to kill everything and I can't stop them. Um, and so that's sort of the end of that section is, you know, the ultimate necrophilia, like Mary Daly said, necrophilia is the end point of patriarchy. And that's so you're, you're sort of at this profound moment in the book where you've gone through just the statism that threads through this entire process for thousands of years, how much they hate women, how much they hate everything that's alive, the animals, the plants, you know, agriculture, all of it, they've taken control of the entire planet and now they're just going to kill it. So you're sort of like, you know, at that peak of despair that radical feminism will bring you to. And then she opens, you know, the third section of the book and she's going to show us where the hope is. So go ahead, Marion. Um, this is really, um, this next section, the spiraling descent, the ledged avengers endless circling the labyrinth from which none return. She falls into this labyrinth, into the room of the dressing where the walls are covered with mirrors, where mirrors are like eyes of men, and the women reflect the judgments of mirrors, where the women stand next to each other, continue dressing next to each other, speak next to each other, as if men were still with them, as if men could overhear their words. The room of the dressing where women sometimes speak in code, the room where each makes her own translation, the room where the women keep to themselves and she teaches her daughter to put on makeup. The room of the half real, where the women partly see each other, where the women partly laugh, partly laugh at the shapes they see in the mirror and the girls once reflected there. The room of the giggling girls, the room in which the girls whisper secrets about each other, where one is said to have larger breasts, where it is whispered, she does not wear a bra. The room in which the girls run giggling to catch their friend with her breasts uncovered. The room of the disowned woman, the room where the women deny she is anything like them. Um, this is one of the best um, descriptions of of grooming um, that I that I've found. Um, the 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 parallel. Um, remember those um, you know those those uh, agriculture manuals. How you breed the land. How you what you plant. Um, how you um, how you turn the soil. Um, when it's time to plant, what seeds are planted where, how you pull the weeds. Um, that's grooming the land. And this is grooming women. One of the best examples of it that I've um, that I've seen. Next slide, please. We enter a new time. But women wake up. I mean, the land, um, if you leave it be, um, the land eventually will come back. I mean, if we if we left the prairies alone and just let the let the grasslands take over again, um, the land would come back. Um, it is because that's what it does. That is it, that is its true nature. Um, and women women come back and women rebel um, because our true nature is that the center of the new time is on the boundary of patriarchal time, 
What it is, is women's own time. It is our lifetime. We live our lives. And that group of giggling girls um, finds Mary Daly, finds Susan Griffin, and finds each other, and they talk. And there are, you know, you can read um, in some of the stuff, especially from, you know, the the trans, um, that they uh, that they don't really like it so much when cis women, like like actual women, um, have uh, have meetings among ourselves, have have places to, to discuss our own specific things that that these guys don't experience, and they don't like it because we talk among ourselves, um, and we find out that 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 um, giggling and who wears a bra that none of that matters. Um, so one of the tasks of women's history is to call into question accepted accepted schemes of periodization um, that that we can. That the, the counting um, that has been done on behalf of women for women have to do this is a big bra size, a small bra size. Um, and we say we are brilliant with light from the stars that began millennia ago and now burn in our mind. Um, she's she's talking about rebellion now. We enter a new time. We, we talk about rebellion. And there's a, a quote near the end of the book um, that's from... Uh, Christabel Pankhurst, back in 1908, we know that relying solely on argument, we wandered for 40 years politically in the wilderness. We know that arguments are not enough and that political force is necessary. We see this. We know this. This is material reality. Next slide, please. I'm trying. Come on. I don't know why it sticks sometimes. I just... Come on. Let's do it, slide. How many times do I have to hit the button? Why are you doing this to me? Oh, come on. Well, uh, the next slide is the very, I'm gonna keep hitting this button. It will eventually get there. Um, but the next slide is, if there's an iconic quote from this book, it's this one. Um, this is very, very much near the end. And it's the famous riverbank quote. We say you cannot divert the river from the riverbed. We say everything comes back and you cannot divert the river from the riverbed. We say every act has its consequences, that this place has been shaped by the river and that the shape of this place tells the river where to go. We say he should have known his actions would have consequences. We say our judgment was that when she raised that rifle, looking through the sight at him and fired, she was acting out what had gone on before. We say every act comes back on itself there are consequences. You cannot cut the trees from the mountainside without a flood. We say there is no way to see his dying as separate from her living or what he had done to her or what part of her he had used. We say, if you change the course of this river, you change the shape of the whole place. And we say that what she did then could not be separated from what she had held sacred in herself, what she had felt when he did that to her what we hold sacred to ourselves, what we feel we could not go on without. And we say, if this river leaves this place, nothing will grow and the mountain will crumble away. And we say what he did to her, her could not be separated from the way that he looked at her and what he felt was right to do to her and what they do to us, we say, shapes how they see us. That once the trees are cut down, the water will wash the mountain away and the river will be heavy with mud and there will be a flood. And we say that what he did to her, he did to all of us. And that one act cannot be separated from another. And had he seen more clearly, we say, he might have predicted his own death. How if the trees grew on that hillside, there would be no flood and you cannot divert this river. We say, look how the water flows from this place and returns as rainfall. Everything returns, we say, and one thing follows another. There are limits, we say, on what can be done and everything moves. We are all part of this motion, we say, and the way of the river is sacred and this grove of trees is sacred and we ourselves, we tell you, are sacred. So that was the last slide and it still won't pop up. <laughs> um, Let me try you know, there's... there and I'll... There's some discussion in the chat about, um, you know, what are women doing about it? We're still oppressed. And and can, you know, do we eventually wake up? I mean, I quoted um, Christabel Pankhurst um, going even further back to 1948 in Seneca Falls, um, the Declaration of um, Sentiments and, and Resolution. 
Um, the history of mankind is a history of repeated injuries and usurpations on the part of man toward women, woman having in direct object the establishment of an absolute tyranny over her. To prove this, let facts be submitted to a candid world. Um, we keep having to do this. Um, 1848, um, you know, the and, and then the first wave, getting the you know, women getting the vote. Uh, the second wave, um, I will not dignify the third wave <laughs> with calling it feminism. Um, but we we cannot be um, we cannot be um, suppressed forever um, because it is not in our nature to do it. It's not in our material nature. We are born as females, um, and and anything that is um, that is Im imputed to us, that is that anything that we are told our lives should be or can't be, um, is is artificial. That is not material reality. That is the the I ideals that that um that fight material reality. But we we keep rising up. We keep rising up. You you give the prairie a chance, and the grasses will will come back, um and and take over again. Um, you give us you give us you know one little crack, um and and we will keep doing um do having to do the same thing over and over again. Um, but we will keep doing it. We will not stop. We we will not stop. Um, not sure what to add to that except to say, oh, there was one um unusual uh little little thing in there um where it describes um a man uh, presumably I think um John James Audubon who was a you know who, who you know had the first um like um um collection um and um of um, of birds you know he he. He, um, you know, published um, his works. He knew the anatomy, showed people pictures. And the way he did it was, was he killed them. He had to kill them to get the bird in the hand. And there was no cameras. So he had to do that. So there's this man, presumably Audubon, killing and preserving and then mounting an eagle to preserve the birds of America. The whole process um, is described. And he had no feeling about it. Um, and or, or if he did, that they were never mentioned or discussed. It was suppressed. Um, so men's feelings in conquering nature um, are suppressed. There are no feelings. It is, and it's not even dissociative because um, he he's not socialized to have those feelings in the first place. So there's nothing to suppress. And it's com contrasted with or compared to a woman medical student who was overcome with feeling in the anatomy lab. Um, her feelings were never acknowledged or addressed, um, and uh, and and that's you know held to be anal um, analogous. Um, it is for the most part, um, but um, I can attest to, uh, I'm a physician, so I took, it's called gross anatomy lab, you know, the, the, the little cells, are, it's, it's histology, but when you go in and you dissect a cadaver, um, that's gross anatomy lab, and everybody goes in, and all these medical students go into this big lab, um, which smells like the stuff they use to keep the, uh, um, to keep the, the dead bodies from really becoming odiferous, and you go in there, and everybody's nervous the first day. And everybody's kind of joking around and laughing a little bit. Everybody names their cadavers. We named ours Flesh Gordon, my dissection group. There were six of us. Um, but the first day, the very first day, the the chief of the anatomy department, this very, very um, uh, formidable woman who was said to take no prisoners, um, um, got us all quiet and um, um, was was and very, very strictly laid down um responsibility to be respectful that there would be no tolerance for not seeing the body as a human being worthy of worthy of respect um and she understood that we were nervous um but but um was was absolutely um firm that we needed to be respectful um and 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 we and we were but you have to um have some measure of dissociation and and not feeling in order to cut into what you know this human body it may no longer be alive, but it's a human body. So I kind of get um, the uh, suppression of um, of um, feelings. Um, but as long as it's a suppression and it's not being taught from the first day you're born, and this is the difference between male and female socialization, being being taught from the first day you're born not to have feelings and emotions um, and to be taught that, you know, it's, it's okay. You know, we have feelings and emotions. Um, but that there is a time and a place to suppress them. That is a completely different thing. It's a it's a contrast in a way that um, um, that uh, it, I, I don't I think the book um, kind of missed a little bit, probably because she um, she didn't uh, 
she never went through that. Um, my, I just to throw in, I completely agree with you. And my ex also had to do cadaver lab in school. And so they spent a year with these, you know, cadavers. Um, and she talks about the same experience that it's the smell. You never forget the smell, apparently the formaldehyde and whatnot is, is pretty overwhelming. Um, and there was, you know, that sort of gallows humor where people are feeling incredibly uncomfortable at being in the presence of a dead body. And then what they're going to have to do to this body, which is a human being, even if it's, you know, dead. Um, and, and there were these sort of, you know, everybody wanted to have these sort of jokey names that, you know, it's a, it's a way to sort of divert a lot of that nervousness, which is completely understandable. But she was like, no, our cadaver's named Margaret, and we're just going to leave it at that because she just wanted to keep that level of respect. Um, but it is definitely a disturbing experience. Apparently, a lot of people passed out the first week. Um, it was it's a hard thing to do. Um, and I and I think these things should be hard. That's the point. Like you can. Like, it's important that we know that it's hard and we remember to feel it and that we don't, you know, suppress it because life is filled with those kinds of hardships. But sometimes we do have to face them and we have to learn to sort of reintegrate the experience afterwards as well, even if we have to, you know, just be totally frontal lobes while we're getting through it. So, um, yeah, I, I completely understand that thing about the the cadaver. And, yeah, the, there's a lot of stuff like that in the in the book, too, that's just... Well, when we were talking yesterday, you and I were talking about Marion Sims, the, the gynecology guy, um, and it, it, probably a lot of women don't, might not, on this seminar might not know, but he's supposed to be like the father of modern gynecology. He tortured women to get this information to do. He had four enslaved women, four black women that he literally kept in, you know, in, in a, in a, in, in a, like a shed essentially by themselves that he locked them in there for years and he did experiment after experiment on them. And yep. that's where modern gynecology comes from. So he's a horrible man and he did horrendous things to these women. And that's how he developed the th some of the things that we know about. It's, it's hard, right? Because of course we need, you know, medical care for women, but this is where it comes from in the, in the, the trajectory of sort of Western science. It, it's about torture. I should mention that, you know, in anatomy lab, um, you know, everybody just did what they did. And you would think that the, the genitalia would be, you know, difficult and people couldn't get themselves to do that. And my lab group, actually, I mean, I was an out lesbian and, and they knew it and nobody else was. It was two men and four women, including me. And, you know, when we got to the penis and scrotum, they all looked at me and handed me the scalpel telling me, well, this must be a dream come true for you. And and, and it wasn't. I mean, I just needed to learn anatomy. Um but what was difficult for everybody when we finally got to the face and had to dissect the face, absolutely no one, um, and I don't know, 150 of us, absolutely no one wanted to be the first one to put a scalpel in to dissect the face and the facial muscles. Really you know, important to know that anatomy, but nobody wanted to be the first to do that um, because that was a reminder of how human um, this this individual before us was. Um, but the, I mean, the, the, the point of the book and the thing Again, you know, you thought at the beginning, you're just like, what, where was he getting all this from? And if you haven't read Plato's Allegory of the Cave, you don't, you know, it's just like, oh, where is this coming from? If you haven't read, you know, about Cartesian dualism, you're like, where is this coming from? Um, but eventually, just, just go with it. Just go with it and read it. There's some stuff in the back of the book that tells you where, you know, where it came from. You know, I mean, she talks later on about the um, the myth of um, Demeter and Persephone. Um you know, the Hades um, um, abducting and raping Demeter's daughter, Persephone. Um, I mean, you don't need to know where all that came, comes from unless you really want to want to um, um, pursue it. Um, just go with it. Um, by the end of the book, again, what Lear said, it's not a polemic. Um, it gets very, very poetic at the end, um, very poetic. Um, and it and it talks about something that um, several women um, have commented on that, um, but we're not doing anything about it, but this keeps happening to women. Um, yeah, it does, but we keep fighting, you know, we just, we just keep fighting. You're not going to, you're not, you know, we're not going to give up. Um, I don't know if we should, uh, specifically ask for questions right now. If anybody has, um, uh, questions, you can put them in the Q and A, um, and I can, 
I've been trying to halfway pay attention to the uh, to the chat as we go along um, to see uh, uh, mainstream medicine is necroph necrophilic. Um, that's a, a really good um, a really good point. Um, and again, um, part of the contrast with um, man's um, um, handling of handling of nature um, versus versus women and women's bodies. Um, I, there are there is a reason why the, why there is a a, um, a a saying or a phrase a fate worse than death um, that um, there is a fear of death and there is a fear of of death for its own sake um, no matter how it happens or why it happens and most of us realize that if somebody is you know very very old um, has a terrible quality of life can't you know has no one to to care about them. Um, is um, it is unable to take care of themselves? Um, is you know, and just it, is is um, very unhappy with uh, um, the loss of uh, loss of independence, or or they're becoming very very demented and can no longer recognize the people who love them. Most of us recognize that that you know, um, death is a uh, um, the next the next thing, the next stage. That that's what happens after that. And there, there may be um, a, a piece of a person inside um, who say this would be welcome, and they and they relax themselves into the arms of death um, as not a bad thing, but just as the next, you know, the next piece of life. What is the quote from the end of the Harry Potter, the next great adventure? I don't know whether it's an adventure, um, but people recognize that um, there is that is different. Um, and this is something that something that male socialization and patriarchy does not recognize. That is very, very different from allowing nature to die, for allowing um, the vast swath of America's grasslands to die. That's very different from allowing um, the, the, the magnificent timber of the Pacific Northwest to be cut down and die. Um, and it's not like it's not like it, it comes back the same because it really doesn't come back the same. I mean, you, you, you know, you destroy the grasslands, they'll kind of come back. You cut down all the redwoods. Yeah, they'll regrow. But there's a difference between, you know, um, a redwood that's that's, you know, 400 years old and one that's 50 years old. Um, and and that is something I think that's kind of in there in the book and weaves through it. Um, but but um, patriarchy does not recognize. The um, like the uh, just to your point about the different kinds of death. I know that in the in the Greek language, there's two different words for life. And one is Zoe and one is bios. And the reason there's two different words is because one is the individual life. So your life, my life, you know, the life of that redwood tree, the, the life of that dog sitting on the couch. Um, and then the other is life as a whole. And these are two different things because every life is going to end. But as long as this is done well, every life is then you know, in our deaths, we become food for the next phase of life, you know, so so life as a whole will then continue on. And, you know, our bodies nurture that. So there's an understanding there that there's these two different things. And the problem with patriarchy as it stands now is that it is, in fact, killing all of it. It's not just an individual death, as horrible as that is for, you know, the women and the animals murdered. Um it's all life is what they're going after and they're doing a pretty good job of it. So yeah. Um, there's a lot of grimness in this book and you do have to face a lot of uh, fairly traumatizing bits, but she does, I mean, the book does end on a very hopeful, resilient note. It doesn't give us a path forward. It's like we said, it's not a, it's not a polemical text. It's not, you know, a kind of throw down, well, here's what we have to do, but it does tell us that it's possible to break out of the patriarchal consciousness and to remember something much deeper and better that we all know that we are connected to that biophilic force. And so resistance is possible. I mean, that's why I love that passage about, you know, you cannot divert the river from the riverbed because she's talking about a woman killing a man who has abused her. And this woman has had enough and she shoots him. And that whole chorus of women is there saying, yes, he should have known that this is what happens. <laughs> when you divert the river, when you kill the mountain, there is now a landslide. You can only disturb life so much. And then there is, you know, a, a fight back. There is, there are consequences. 
Um, so it's there. I mean, the resistance is there in this book, even that, even though that's not exactly what it's about. It's absolutely, you know, one of the notes that the book ends on and is certainly worth cultivating, you know, in our souls. Um, the book does end on a positive note. I mean, it ends quoting Christabel Pankhurst, um, you know, which is a, a pretty positive note. And then again, there's stuff in the chat about, um, you know, so so why do women protect their sons and sacrifice their daughters? Why do they do that? I I always have felt like um, female socialization is actually part of male socialization. Male socialization is about dominance, about it's about violating boundaries, um, and and it knows that to be able to do that, you know, that you somehow need to have the consent of the people you want to, whose boundaries you want to violate and who you want to dominate. Um, so male, female socialization is sort of a creation of patriarchy. Um, and, and we can choose to not participate in it. Um, but it may mean disrupting or rebelling against some things that, um, many women think, um, are the way it's supposed to be. Many women hold dear, um, don't protect your sons. Just don't, you know, um, and I don't, you know, we're not going to solve this in the next, in the next five minutes, but. Um, this is a this is a really important book if you want to explore further in in the uh, um, the um, the the nature part of it you know um, read just a really basic environmental science you know book or look up um, about um, about you know cycles you know about about life cycle analysis about about land use about sustainability um, sustainability means that the planet can only grow so much food to feed so many people. And after that, it collapses. You know, the planet only has so much fossil fuels to sustain so many people at, you know, certain minimal amounts of use for so long. And then, and then you can't do it anymore. Um, and the, anal you know, the analogy to women is that you can, you can try to crush women um, for just so long. And then eventually we will rebel and it will no longer, that crushing will no longer be effective. And that's a, that's a, um, that's a hopeful message. I mean, that's a hopeful mes message. Yeah, and I really just want to emphasize here at the end, what an extraordinary thing she did. That, you know, if you go back and read this book, she's creating this theory. Like, nobody had said this before. She's pulling all of this together. And just this absolutely vast overarching critique of the entirety of civilization and particularly Western science and nobody had done that. She put all the pieces together to say, this is what men are doing to the planet. This is the philosophy that they've created to let themselves do it. This is how they've eroticized it. And this is how they are now controlling every bit of life, including women, um, you know, in the service of this incredible necrophilia. And this is where it's going to end is with the destruction of all life. So she saw all of that and she wrote this amazing book. It's not even just you know, like she put the pieces together and, you know, ABC. I mean, it's so beautifully written. It is so moving. And it, the prose is just, I mean, it's just poetry flowing through the page. You, it's its a whole experience, honestly. And if you haven't read this book, you really should. You really, really should. This is absolutely central to radical feminism. And I don't think that it gets, um, it just doesn't get the reread that it should. Like most people, have, if you're in radical feminist world, you've heard of Mary Daly, you've heard of Dworkin, even if you have re haven't read all of it, you know it's there. But I don't think we remember Susan Griffin in the same way, and we really should. And she's still alive. She's not dead. She's 80, 81 years old, and she's still she's still kicking. So, um, you know, she's one of our elders. And this book is really, she, I mean, she created a whole movement with this book, the e ecofeminism, you can call it that. But I know this had a profound influence. I read it when I was 17. It had a profound influence on me, the way that Daly and Dworkin both did as well. Um, so I, I just can't tell, you know, just encourage you enough to to dive into this book. You will not regret it. Yeah, and parting words, never give up, never surrender, never. Just don't. Um, I guess that's about it. We even have 30 seconds to go. What else can we do in 30 seconds? <laughs> um, it is an interesting way. It's a tough read. And I, when I read it again, I was like, why did I, why did I not reread this since I was like you know, 19 yeah. years old? And um, some of it is disturbing, um, but it it really was a, a milestone, unrecognized. Thank Thanks, everybody. Thank you.